Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another riveting chemistry lecture where we will cover absolutely no chemistry yet. Don't worry, we're building up to it. Um, we're going to spend today working mostly on um, more practice with unit conversions and then doing some problem solving with conversions. And we'll be practicing with our sig figs and trying to pay attention and kind of further define um, all of the various um, ways we can tell whether something is an exact number or a measured number as well, since that makes a big difference when it comes to figuring out how with these conversions, um, how many uh, sig figs to keep in our final answer. Um, first off, random chemistry stuff. Um, I kind of I wanted to make a point this week of, of uh, getting to all of your quiz questions on Tuesday or Monday, um, especially the ones that were relevant to the course. Usually, I'll save a few of them, um, so we'll have some random chemistry questions to answer on on Wednesday as well. Um, but for now, um, I thought I'd share some of my favorite sciencey um, re internet resources. Um, this compound interest is a really cool blog. Um, by a guy from the UK who's really good at doing graphic design, making some really cool infographics. They're sort of chemistry related. Um, and so he's got lots of stuff on, you know, for instance, the chemistry of, of uh, the vaccine development for COVID, um, the chemistry of, where's the rest of the uh, post there? Um, oh, you have to go to the other link. Um, so International Women's Day, highlighting 100 women in chemistry, and goes through what the, all the various things are. You just, so it's just a really cool um, blog in general that has some fun infographics as well. Um, one of the, you know, if you're interested in beer, you can find the chemistry of tequila or the chemistry of hop oils or mojitos, and what are the various compounds that make a mojito taste different than a margarita. Um, so there's lots of cool cool stuff here. Um, I just, uh, it's a fun way to spend some time just sort of browsing. If you want to see just how related chemistry is to your particular field, you can come in here and find all sorts of stuff. Um, environmental chemistry is covered in here. Um, and then also I linked a bunch of Utah YouTube channels that I find really cool. I'll use some of them for demonstrations. Um, the backyard scientist is particularly interesting. He's really good at making things really, really hot. And then he pours melted stuff into other things. So he does, you know, there's a video where he melts salt. And here's the interesting thing about melted salt it actually turns purple when it melts um, because it changes the wavelength of light that salt can absorb. Um, and when you pour it into cold water, it actually explodes. Um, and so he blew up a 10 gallon aquarium by pouring melted salt into it, um, which is kind of fun. He's got a really cool high speed camera. So, um, and speaking of cool high speed cameras, Smarter Every Day is just this guy who's, a, I think he's a mechanical engineer in his day job. Um, and he does things like, well, what would happen if I designed this thing that could swing a golf club at, um, you know, at 500 miles per hour? And then he sets it up in his garage and with a high speed camera and actually uses a machine to swing a golf club at 500 miles an hour. And it just destroys the golf club um, and the ball like flattens like a pancake and then rebounds. And so just random fun stuff you could look. Um, Professor Dave explains might actually be very helpful for this class or other science classes um, because he's. He basically was a grad student who just got sick of being a grad student and started making YouTube videos on um, on chemistry. And so he has some really good um, other ways of explaining some similar topics to what we're going to go over. Um, and his, his production value is better than what I can do myself, actually. Um, and then some, some that are probably to be expected, NASA has their own YouTube channel that's really, really fun. It was really cool to watch the um, the uh, latest rover touchdown on Mars. You could see, you know, watch them live stream the control um, control room from NASA while they were doing that. That was super fun. And then um, if you've never checked out the Monterey Bay Aquarium's YouTube channel, it's wonderful for studying because they just have live webcams of all their exhibits um, with 
a lot of times with like, you know, lo-fi hip hop beats or whatever ambient music going on in the background. Um, and so you could just sit and watch jellyfish while you're studying. It's very pleasant. Um, the otters are usually pretty interesting, although I don't see them right now. Oh, there they are. You just watch the otters go around and play. Occasionally somebody comes by and moves the camera to wherever the otters are. Just fun things to have on. Um, I've put on the jellyfish when my kids were feeling tired but wired at the same time. Um, I put that on the TV and they've just sat and watched the jellyfish like 15 minutes, like zoned out, and then you know popped back up ready to go, like kids do. Um anyway, I'll find any other random cool chemistry or sciencey stuff that I find that's relevant to what we're talking about. I'll try to make sure I bring it in so you can find. Um, have the uh, benefit of all my time I've spent reading about science stuff on the internet. All right, let's, so this was some review for some of those prefixes. So if we, um, we will start by kind of going over some of those prefixes that we ended with the other day. Um, if we wanted to write a conversion for each of these or inequality, technically, but it's the same thing as a conversion, right? Once we know how to use them that way. Um, if we have a thousand meters, that's going to be one what? Kilometer. Kilometer. There we go. Right. If we have one times 10 to the minus three grams. So you might have to think about it a little bit. 10 to the no minus gram. three. No. Yeah, 10 to the minus three is a thousandth, right? It's one divided by a thousand. So 10 to the minus three grams is a milligram. 0 0.01 meters is one centimeter. Centimeter. Very good. So um, now we fill this in. Let's take it, um, take a second and try to write them backwards. We could write a thousand meters is one kilometer, or we could write one meter is how many kilometers? How would the other way of writing it be? So one meter equals blank kilometers. So it's a thousandth of a kilometer, right? So that would be. You could either write 0 0.001 kilometers. Very good. Um, you could write it in scientific notation as well. You could say one times 10 to the minus three kilometers. Those are identical ways of writing the same number, right? Or we're not really converting anything from scientific notation to regular notation. It's just a different way of writing the same number. Oops. If we wanted to write, if we have 0 0.001 grams is one milligram, we, the other way of writing that would be 1,000 milligrams equals one gram. And again, this is the one that I was that I mentioned before that I usually find the the form of the of the conversion where you're dealing with numbers that are that are greater than one it's easier to wrap, wrap your head around so you could write it either of these and be correct um i i would tend to prefer to write it the second way a thousand milligrams equals one gram um and then occasionally just as a way of shorthand instead of if we're dealing with these um prefixes a lot of times it's not really necessary to write a thousand or a million or even write one times 10 to a power. You can actually just use one times anything is going to be just what you started with, right? So frequently these, these conversions are just going to be written as one or just 10 to the three milligrams. <clears throat> All right, so these are all, those are all equivalent ways of writing the exact same thing, which means we can use any of them in a conversion factor. 
And if we wanted to write the um, 0 0.01 meters, that's a hundredth of a meter is one centimeter. The other way of writing that would be 100 centimeters or 10 to the two centimeters equals one meter. All right, so there's a, I just put a whole bunch of text on here that makes it a little bit of a, uh, a little bit hard to see what's going on. Nope, not you otters, go away. Um, but all of this to just show you that there's a lot of ways of writing equivalent conversions and they all are going to work. If you do it properly, they will all work mathematically. Mathematically, they'll all give you the exact same answer. If you still go through the process of make sure that both sides of your conversion are equal to each other, and then make sure you're crossing out the right units. And then this one in particular is the one that always bothers me when people mix it up because you guys know it's 100 centimeters in a meter. It's one of the first things about the metric system you learned. And yet some one of you, I will almost guarantee it on the final, one of you will write 100 meters equals one centimeter. It always happens. So just double check those, on, especially on the test, um, and make sure that the answer when you plug it into your calculator matches about what you are expecting. Do your reasonableness check, and that'll minimize the number of times you do that. And it's not like it's particular to you guys. I will, I will mess conversions like this up as well. Um, I just have 50 people staring at me when I'm doing it. So um, you guys usually catch it for me. It's a little bit harder when you have to do your own proofreading, right? All right. So let's do some practice with these. We got a whole page of pra conversion practice. Let's go centimeters to millimeters and milligrams to grams, and millimeters to centimeters. Let's take like five, five minutes or so. 10 minutes or so, and um, then I will write it, write in the answers here, and we can practice, and you can um, double check your answers. All right, I'm going to start working through these on the board here. So centimeters to millimeters. There's a couple ways of doing this. Um, the one that will never let you down um, is if you convert everything back to the base unit first. So there is a conversion that goes straight from centimeters to millimeters, but the um, but it's easier to use a conversion sheet, and you have to memorize fewer things, or and you don't have to be as good at scientific notation and mental arithmetic if you just convert everything to meters first, because you know there's a hundred centimeters in a meter, and you know there's a thousand millimeters in a meter. 
So it means you have to write it as two steps. Say 10 to the two centimeters is one meter. And then you can say one meter is 10 to the three millimeters. And you can combine those two. Did my, did it freeze? There it goes. My internet might be a little bit wonky right now. Um, you can combine these two to say 10 to the two centimeters is 10 to the three millimeters. You could simplify it to say 10 millimeters is one centimeter. Those are all valid things to do, but this is the approach that's never gonna, never going to um, get it quite as confusing. It's a lot, of, when you're trying to do mental arithmetic with powers of 10, um, that's an easy place for you to mess up on a test, right? Um, so rather than do that, take the trouble to write one more conversion step, and then you won't, you don't run the risk of, of um, screwing up your conversion factor. So we want wind up getting divide by 100, then multiply by 1,000. So we get 100 millimeters. And again, there's, that's probably one that you knew how to do in your head without writing it out. But at the same time, practice on the easy ones is going to make the hard ones a lot easier to follow the process. Um, let's do uh, 450.01 milligrams to grams. Well, that's going to be a one step conversion because we're going to our base unit from milligrams to grams. So you just have to make sure that you get the right multiplier. A thousand milligrams is one gram. So we're going to be dividing by a thousand. So 0. 0.45001 grams. And remember this zero doesn't count as a significant figure. Any zeros to the left of our first number are not considered sig figs. So we've got five sig figs here, and then we have an exact conversion. So our answer should also have five sig figs. Um, let's, well, the rest of these are some more, so there's some more interesting ones on the rest. Let's uh, skip millimeters to centimeters, since I think you guys can do that. Um, if you want to see me show the work for that, we can do that at break. Just let me know. Um, seconds to hours. There is a direct conversion for seconds to hours on the conversion sheet. But if you don't have your conversion sheet handy, I expect that everybody knows that there's 60 seconds in a minute and 60 minutes in an hour, right? So this is another one where writing out two conversions instead of one is not a bad idea. So 34.87 seconds. Sixty seconds is one minute. Sixty minutes is one hour. So divide by sixty, divide by sixty again. Get something like point zero eight. Point zero zero nine six eight six. Is this an exact conversion? Is it? It's not about sixty seconds in a minute, right? That's what a minute is. Is sixty seconds. So that's a definition, and so is this which means these numbers are exact, 
So we're going to keep four sig figs in our answer. So 0 0.009686. And this is another one where you could write this as scientific notation. I'm purposely not writing it scientific notation to make a point here. And that's, again, these zeros, even though they're behind the decimal point, they're still to the left of our first non-zero number, which means they don't count as sig figs, right? There's a lot of times People in this class will, will count these as sig figs because they're decimal places. They're still to the left of the first non-zero number, which means they don't count. They're only there to show you where the decimal point goes. Um, I think, so centimeters to inches, is a one-step conversion. It's pretty straightforward. It's worth going over in this context because, again, I'm going to make another point, one that I've already said once before, but just to reiterate. 67.72 centimeters, and we want to go to inches. This is what the only exact conversion between, between metric units and imperial units. The only exact conversion is centimeters to inches. So, and it looks like it's a measured number, which is part of the tricky part. 2.54 centimeters is exactly one inch. So this has infinite sig figs, which means that's not going to define where we round when we plug this into the calculator. We've got to divide by 2.54. And then at the end, we're going to wind up with four sig figs. So 26.66. And then this one's a one that people do mess up too when it comes to conversion. So let's say 2.54 inches is one centimeter. Just remember that a centimeter is smaller than an inch. Again, that's something that you guys probably all know, have, have some experience with. But on your reasonableness check when you're writing this out, there are more centimeters than inches because a centimeter is smaller than an inch. Uh, kilograms to milligrams is another one where uh, you could combine conversion factors, have a conversion factor straight from kilograms to milligrams, but it's going to rely on you doing some mental arithmetic in your head with these prefixes. So it's usually going to work better if you go from kilograms to grams and then grams to milligrams. It's a little extra writing, but What's a little extra writing if, if it's going to keep you from getting the wrong answer, right? So 45.01 kilograms. And again, check, do your reasonableness check. You know a kilogram is bigger than a gram. So in other words, it should take a lot of grams to make one kilogram. And you know one gram is bigger than a milligram. So again, do your reasonableness check. What this winds up telling us is we're going to multiply by a million. Or multiply by a thousand and then multiply by a thousand again.
which is going to be really convenient to write in scientific notation. 4.501 oh, 4 times 10 to the 7 milligrams. All right, and this last one, let's go over the volume one just because we haven't done much with volume yet. We'll spend a lot of time on volume today. Um, but one of the first problems on the homework involves ounces, right? Um, I've mentioned this before, I hate ounces. Ounces and pints and quarts and all that garbage. Um, I just want to get rid of it. I would do everything in gallons and in, in cubic inches if I could when it comes to volume conversions, especially if I'm trying to get to um, the metric system. We'll find out that we can actually use that exact conversion from inches to centimeters. We can actually use that to get an exact conversion from cubic inches to cubic centimeters. Um, and we'll, we'll practice that in a minute, but there's nothing particularly unique about cubic inches. We just have a definition of inches to, of cubic inches to gallons. And if you stick with cubic inches, then you can avoid all of the quarts and ounces and garbage like that. So if we've got 600 cubic inches, that's an odd looking unit to some to some extent, but that doesn't really matter. We've got a conversion that says, 231 cubic inches is one gallon. So despite the fact that the unit looks a little bit different, plugging it in works the same way as anything else. You've got inches cubed on top, cancel inches cubed on bottom. And this is one of the ones where the British system really makes us, I have no idea where the number 231 came from. Um, but that is an exact conversion. The definition of a gallon is 231 cubic inches. You could kind of understand where inches goes to, to feet, you know, 12 inches in a foot. Well, a foot is actually named, is actually originally defined based on the length of the average person's foot. And then inch was about the width of your thumb. And it's about, you could probably sit down and measure, since we're all at home and happy, you probably have your shoes off. Um, you could probably measure how many thumb widths does it take to go from your heel to your toe. It's probably going to be somewhere in the ballpark of 10 to 15. So 12 inches in one foot, that actually kind of makes sense in a weird way. It's a, not a friendly number, but it makes sense. 231 cubic inches to a gallon, no idea where that comes from. That's just out there. Um, so in this case, we'll get something that's going to be, what, two and a third, 2.4, something like that. Um, let me only plug this answer. Alan, I see your question there on the 0.4001. Um, any of these can be written in scientific notation. Uh, you don't have to. It, um, it might be advantageous to. Um, let's see, 600 over 231, 2.6, 2.597. Four sig figs here. This is exact. So our answer should have two four sig figs. Two point Five nine seven is that what I said? Yeah. All right. So, and I think that there, that example that I wrote with um, where we went from kilograms to milligrams, the answer we came up with was four point five zero zero one. There's your decimal times 10 to the 7 milligrams. Um, 
you're never, when you put something in scientific notation, you always want to have your first sig fig left of the decimal point. So we wouldn't write it as 0 0.500 or 45001 times 10 to the 8 milligrams. That's still technically the same number, but that's not scientific notation. Scientific notation, by definition, puts your first sig fig left of the decimal point. Did that answer your question, Alan? Okay. Um, sometimes it's advantageous to keep things in powers of not of three, ten, of ten to the three, because then we can think of it as being thousands or millions or or billions, etc. Um, so you will occasionally see things written in non-standard scientific notation like 45.001 times 10 to the 6 milligrams. Um, just because if you know 10 to the 6 is a million, that gives you a context for how big this number is. It's 45 million. Um, you're never going to go wrong, though, sticking with the traditional scientific notation of one digit left of the decimal. All right, any questions on any of those examples so far? It's all easy enough as long as I'm the one up here doing it on the board, right? And you're following along, it, it gets uh, it gets a lot trickier when I just give you a blank page. Um, but just remember, it's not trickier, it just seems that way because you don't have your safety blanket. Um, it's still the same process though, right? So just pick a spot and start. Start canceling out units. Um, this is just a slide that's basically reiterating um, that there are really, there's a bunch of conversions between US or between British and metric units on the conversion sheet. Um, most of them are not exact though. In fact, the only one that's exact technically is this centimeters to inches, right? So just when you're using any of these other metric to British conversions, make sure that you know they're approximate, meaning that that affects your sig figs at the end. Um, and there is not an exact conversion for, for mass or, um, so you basically, for, 453.59 grams equals one pound. Usually you're not gonna have numbers with more than five sig figs, especially if, you're, if we're dealing with actual measured numbers. So usually this is a big enough, there are enough sig figs in this conversion that it's not gonna be what determines where you have to round. Usually your measurement is where it is gonna determine that. But occasionally it's something you need to pay attention to. Um, it also means that if I tell you you're only allowed to use exact conversions, then going from kilometers to miles is actually a really long conversion. Um, so if you wanted to go from kilometers to miles using only exact conversions, you have to go from kilometers to centimeters. Then you can use the exact conversion of centimeters to inches, and then you have to go inches to feet to miles. So it winds up being like seven conversions in a row if you want to get an exact conversion from kilometers to miles, um, which is why most of the time you just see people use the 1.6 number. 1.6 kilometers equals one mile. It's approximately equal to one mile because that's a lot easier than going the roundabout way. Um, but I'm just going to tell you this right now, that there will be a problem on the test where I'm gonna say, using only exact conversions, go from kilometers to miles or miles to kilometers. I'm gonna make you show me that you can do it the long way at least once on the test, right? Just 
because it's not a particularly tricky one. It just you have to know how to string together all these conversions in a row in order to do it. And so that's a skill that I'm trying to get you to show me when I ask that question. Um, and so let's practice that right now. Let's say we have 10 kilometers and let's put some more sig figs on that. Let's say 10.000 kilometers to miles. Take a second, write it out. If you if you're a runner, you probably already have a rough idea of how many miles 10 kilometers is or ride bicycles. Um, but try and get with five sig figs. Go the long route. All right, now my little whiteboard here. I probably took you most of, a, of uh, an entire line on uh, binder paper, right? It's writing seven conversions in a row takes up a lot of space. I'm going to do my best on my little whiteboard here to make it all fit, but I might have to do it on two rows. So 10.000 kilometers. We're trying to get to centimeters because we need to use that exact conversion. So one kilometer, 10 to the three meters. And let me zoom in again so you guys can read the whiteboard. All right, so kilometers to meters. Meters to centimeters. And since I know I'm going to run out of room, this is as good a place as any to hit enter on my calculator um, and write a number in. So we're going to get 10 times 10 to the 3 times 10 to the 2 to get 1.0005 sig figs times 10 to the six centimeters or a million centimeters, plus or minus 10 centimeters. If we take that in, and start another conversion, we're going to cancel out centimeters and be left in inches. 2.54 centimeters is one inch. We're trying to get to miles, so we want to go to feet first. Inches to feet. 12 inches is one foot. And 5,280 feet is one mile. So after we plug all that in, get a number that you probably already knew or had an idea about what it should be. We know that kilometers and miles are 
kilometers are smaller than a mile, but they're about the same, right? As far as in the same ballpark of size. So if we're doing our reasonableness check, we should get something close to 10 for our answer. Within a factor of 10, it should be bigger than one and it should be less than 100 at least. Right, so as long as we get a number that's between one and 100, we probably did our conversion right. Even if you don't know that there's about six miles in a, in 10, in a 10K, and we're gonna get All right, so nothing particularly tricky about this is just long. So just pay attention to it, make your units cancel out. And most of the unit conversions that we'll do in this class are gonna be along those same lines. They're not particularly tricky, they're just long and you have to have an idea of where you're going or it's easy to get lost. There's a lot of conversions on that conversion sheet, right? So I, you could have started converting kilometers and gone totally a different direction and ended up converting into something that you don't even care about, right? You could still do all the steps right, but if you're not answering the question I asked, it's no good. What's the, what's the old saying? What does that have to do with the price of tea in China? Like, well, so, so you converted 10 kilometers into parsecs. Good for you. That doesn't really answer the question of how many miles that is, right? So know which way you're going, have a rough idea of what conversions you're gonna use before you start and you'll minimize running into that problem. And I have to say, five-year-olds are masters of the non sequitur. They will be having a rational discussion about why she can or cannot do a particular thing. And all of a sudden we're discussing something her brother did three years ago, or, you know, you know, the last time we were on zoom with her grandparents or something like that. And I have no idea when she that, you know, made that transition. All right, so we're getting close to taking a break here, but this is the next tricky concept. So I want to, I want you guys to hear it once and then we'll take a break and then I'll reiterate. Um, occasionally we're going to need to deal with what are referred to as higher powers of units. Um, so higher powers of units usually means that we're dealing with units that are squared or cubed. So for instance, if we're dealing with areas or volumes, we're not dealing in units, we're dealing in what are called derived units. Because if you take a centimeter, a centimeter is a primary unit. It's not really derived from anything else. It's just a, a set distance. If you take, but if you take centimeter times a centimeter, you get a totally different property. You're not talking about length anymore, you're talking about area. And so when we have these derived units, um, that changes how we convert things a little bit. We don't usually deal with um, area. Area doesn't really have its own units for the most part. Acres, kind of, um, but acres is still a derived unit that has a definition based on square feet. So when we have square units, that's just like if we had one square centimeter, that's just like having a box that is one centimeter by one centimeter, right? If we have a square. If we wanna convert that though, we would have to convert both sides of the square, right? If we wanna convert this box into inches, 
we have to convert both sides of the box before we could get the right area, right? And so we frequently will not have a nice neat box when we're actually talking. If I just say, you know, um, a, a particular classroom is 110 square feet. You don't know what the dimensions are in each side of that box, right? So you can't really just convert both sides, the length and the width of the box into square into feet. You have to actually deal with the area. But the only thing we really need to do in order to do that is it just means that just like if we had um, x squared and we wanted to cancel out x squared, we would need to divide by x twice. If we're going to cancel out both powers of this unit, we need to do it twice. We have If we just have inches on the bottom and we have inches squared over here, we've got to do the conversion twice. And that's equivalent to converting both sides of the box individually. We just don't need the actual dimensions of the box to do it. Right, so, and when we square conversion factors, we square everything inside it. Remember that we have to use, distribute that squared to everything. So we actually would wind up with one squared, inches squared, 2.54 squared and centimeters squared in order to do this conversion. And so anytime we have higher powers of units that we want to convert, we just have, we can use the same conversions we normally would. We just have to square them or cube them. So this is what I meant by, and we could get rid of quarts and ounces entirely and just have cubic inches because then we can use 2.54 centimeters equals one inch. We would just have to cube it if we were going from cubic centimeters to cubic inches but it still would be an exact conversion then. All right, so we'll take our break here. When we come back, we'll start working on this. So over the break, um, or before we come back, let's, and I'll give you a couple extra minutes. So let's say we're gonna come back at uh, 2.30 and I'll start working through this. What is the volume of this box in cubic inches? And so take a couple seconds, work on it now, or come back um, from break and start working on it. I'm going to go ahead and mute to, so you have time to do it yourself.
All right, we can start working our way through this. Um, if we are dealing with a nice neat box and you have the measurements for all three dimensions of that box, it's in totally a valid um, approach to convert each of these centimeters into inches and then just do length times width times height in inches. Um, if we don't have the measurements, we just have a volume, that's not really an option though. So we'll start by finding the volume in cubic centimeters, and then we'll find the volume in cubic inches. And Zoom has introduced a new feature on my end where I can pause screen share. Um, so this should look like I stopped screen share and be able to use the whiteboard and you'll be able to see that. But let me know if that doesn't work. So is this, and then I should be able to zoom in a bit. All right, so our volume in cubic centimeters, volume of a box is length times width times height, right? Length times width times height. Uh, doesn't matter what we call length, width, and height, right? Because it's of the, was that the transitive property of, uh, of multiplication? Doesn't matter which order we put them in. Transitive or the community? communicative? I don't remember. It's been a long time since I had number theory. When we plug all that in, we'll get a volume in cubic centimeters. They have 531.6. We're only gonna keep three sig figs though, because our 7.68 number and 5.56 number each only have three sig figs. So 5.32. I'm sorry, 532 cubic centimeters is our volume in cubic centimeters. Now, if we want to put this into cubic inches, now that we have it in cubic centimeters, we're still, we have a direct conversion from centimeters to inches, which means we can still use that we just have to do it three times. 2.54 centimeters is one inch. We need to cancel out all three powers of centimeters. Or another way of thinking about it is we need to convert all three sides of the box. So we're gonna cube that entire, um, that entire conversion factor. And that's going to cube everything in it. So centimeters become centimeters cubed. We're going to cube 2.54. We're going to cube one, which is not going to change it. And we're going to cube cubic inch or cube inches to get cubic inches. When you're plugging that in on your calculator, that can just look like 532 divided by 2.54 cubed. although it does help when you plug it into your calculator properly. So I get 32.5, which seems like it's kind of a small number. That seems a bit like we did a conversion wrong, but remember, it's the equivalent of we're gonna divide by two and a half, 
And then we're going to take that answer and divide by two and a half again. And then we're going to take that answer and divide by two and a half again. 2.54 cubed is about 10, roughly. So we're approximately dividing 500 by 10, which should give us something close to 50. Again, really roughly. And now all of a sudden with that context, this starts looking a little bit more reasonable, right? Right, so the trickiest thing about these when it comes is making sure you plug it in properly and get your exponent done properly. Um, if you use parentheses incorrectly, it'd be really easy to divide by 2.54 and then take that answer and cube it. And that's not going to give you the right answer. You have to follow order of operations correctly. All right, last part of this question. We have 32.5 cubic inches, and we want to find the volume in gallons. How do we do that? OK, and so while you're thinking about that, here's a good question. Um, if you convert all three sides of the box to inches and then multiply them together, you get an answer that's almost the same. You get 32.4 cubic inches. That's actually not the wrong answer. Because remember that the, with our rules of rounding and uncertainty, we're supposed to be plus or minus 1 in this last digit, right? That's how we know where to round is based on keeping our uncertainty in the right place. So we did the calculations differently and got 32.5 and 32.4, but that's the same number within significant figures. We, the, the phrase is within sig figs, that's the same number. In other words, it's within the uncertainty of our measurements. Right. So just because your calculator spits out a number that's very slightly different, as long as you're you're only off by, by one, maybe two in the last sig fig, then that's still considered the same number. If we want to take this 32.5 cubic inches and you want to get um, gallons from that, well, we have a conversion for cubic inches to gallons. So 32.5 cubic inches. And 231 inches cubed is one gallon. Do we need to cube this conversion? I'm seeing some shaking heads. Why not? Because you're going to eliminate the cube. Yeah, exactly, because the cube is already part of the conversion. We Our conversion already has inches cubed as part of it. So if we cubed this, we would get gallons cubed and inches to the ninth. And I don't know about you, but I don't know what inches to the ninth looks like. It's not a volume anymore, at least, right? So if the, inch, if the higher power of the unit is already part of your conversion, then you don't need to worry about this. All right, and so then I believe somebody put in the chat 0. 0.141 gallons, which sounds about right. Um, also worth pointing out one conversion on this page here. Let me go back to screen sharing. Um, that is a conversion that's very, very handy, although it's it's such a basic conversion that it almost is not considered a conversion. Um, right here, based on the way a milliliter and a centimeter are defined, one milliliter is, by definition, exactly the same to one cubic centimeter. 
which means that's a really, really easy conversion to do in your head, right? You're going to wind up multiplying y1 and dividing by one, and you're switched from milliliters to cubic centimeters. In other words, anytime you see milliliters written, you can replace it with cubic centimeters. You don't even really need to show the conversion because they are literally the exact same thing. Um, I don't know why, but for some reason um, in hospitals, um, in syringes especially, um, cubic centimeters are used instead of milliliters. Um, I don't, maybe it's just easier to say, maybe it sounds more dramatic if you say CCs. CC stands for cubic centimeter. So when you hear 50 CCs, that's 50 milliliters. Um, maybe it just rolls off the tongue better or is less apt to be misunderstood in a high stress environment. Um, but for whatever reason, we do use these two units interchangeably. Just know that they're identical. Um, and you can show the conversion to go from milliliters to cubic centimeters. It's just not going to change anything. All right. Well, that got formatting got a little bit funky on that. Um, oh, that's because I'm showing. Okay. Um, if we wanted to, we have a combined unit like speed. Oh, I see what's happening here. Just from when I was showing my work last spring. If we wanted to do this conversion right here, we want to go meters per second into kilometers per hour. There's a couple different approaches you can take here that are mathematically going to be the same. Um, remember that anytime you've got a fraction like this as part of your units, there's an implied one on the bottom, right? Meters per second. Per means literally for every, um, which is also where the term percent comes from. Cent means 100, right? So percent literally means for every hundred. Um, well, if you got 22.0 meters and one second, you can convert each of those into different units. You can convert meters into kilometers and you can convert seconds into hours and take your, your answers and just put them in as that fraction, put kilometers over the number you get for hours, right? And so, if we wanted to do that, meters to kilometers is easy. Seconds to hours is, it's not particularly tricky anyway. Um, it's a couple steps. Um, and that'll work out just fine. You wind up with 22 meters is 0 0.0220 kilometers. You'll wind up with one second is one over 3,600 hours. And then you get a, um, a number that's going to allow us to do some, some math here. The other way to do it that's a little bit more, um, I don't know if elegance is the right word, but it at least allows you to do it on one line on your, on your paper, is if we just treat the unit on bottom just like it's a fraction, like it is. So I go back to the board. If I want to do 22 meters per second into kilometers per hour, The easiest way to do this is just like any other conversion. We're just going to cancel out seconds until we're left in, in hours. We're just going to do it sort of backwards. Instead of putting the unit that we want to cancel out on bottom on our first conversion, it has to go on top. But there's nothing inherently different about how we're doing this process. It's just allowing us to say, okay, well, 60 seconds goes on top instead of on bottom. And then we want to, can that allows us to cancel out seconds. We want to cancel out minutes be left in hours. And 
And then we can, at the same time, we can be do, doing conversions to cancel out meters and get kilometers, right? We can say every 10 to the three meters is one kilometer. And again, mathematically, this would work the exact same way. If you, if you took one second and you converted it to hours, and if you took meters and converted it to kilometers, and then you just take kilometers divided by meters. Or you can set it all up on one line this way. You get times 60 times 60 over 1,000. 79.2. kilometers per hour, right? And mathematically, everything canceled out except for kilometers and hours, right? So there's a lot of different ways we can use the same basic ideas of just make the units cancel out. And if you went the what I would consider the long way, but might be simpler, if you converted 22 meters to kilometers, and if you converted one second into hours, you would get something like uh, 0 0.0220 kilometers over 2.78 times 10 to the minus four. When you do that math, you should get this same number within sig figs, right? So either way, either way works. All that you really need to do for these combined units is make sure that the units cancel out properly and that you used all true conversions and you probably did it right. Right, there's a lot of different strategies when it comes to some of these, these word problems to get to the right answer. Um, the other thing's really useful. All right, so this this is the the um, work showing the separate conversions versus converting both at the same time. So you can either take twenty two meters, convert to kilometers, take seconds, convert to hours and then put them together. Or that's mathematically identical to the way I did it on the board. Um, that also will allow us to do things like convert miles per hour into feet per second. Or convert I think this one's a more interesting one. It's a little different than what we just did. Um, USD is is uh, the the mathematical way of writing US dollars. It throws all of the math off if you have to put the dollar sign in front of the number. That's a silly system anyway. Um, so they put they converted the dollar sign into USD as your as a unit. If you have a gas price that is dollars per gallon and you want to convert it to euros per liter, we can do the same thing. So take a second, give that a try.
So I wind up being one conversion of space shy, being able to fit it all on one line on my whiteboard. To get from gallons to liters, based on the conversions that are given to you, there, if you could, if you went and looked up a gallons to liters conversion with at least four sig figs, you could do it in one step. But based on what you have in front of you, um, the conversions that you would want to go is you want to go from gallons to cubic inches, cubic inches to cubic centimeters, and then cubic centimeters to liters. So for this first row, what I actually wind up calculating is um, we didn't do anything with dollars yet, right? So at the end of this row, I've converted gallons into liters. So I wind up with units of dollars per liter. So, and then if we have a conversion and I have no idea what the conversion rate is for euros to dollars right now. Um, this was from last year. Um, I have no, I don't follow exchange rates really. Um, so I can't really say if it's accurate or not. But at least we should wind up with something, I believe, a little bit under 1.8 or something like that. Point two five nine over two thirty one over two point five four cubed times thousand point eight oh with sig figs four sig figs point eight six oh nine so that's our price in dollars per liter. That looks a little bit weird to take dollars out to the 0 0.0001 decimal, right? To the 10 thousandths place. If it's dollars, do I have to round it at cents? Is money a measured number? We're getting into philosophy a little bit, right? But yeah, money is absolutely a measured number. It's not exact. In fact, that's why on gas stations, they put in nine tenths of a penny at the end. Um, they're not just rounding off that nine tenths of a penny. So, and you better believe any sort of calculations that are happening with money when it comes to interest and things like that. Um, you know, everybody's seen the movie Office Space, right? those tenths of a penny that are rounded off at the end, um, they're actually rounded in a very, very specific way. And I'll give you a hint, it's never in your favor as the consumer. Um, those tenths of a pennies add up to real money for the banks, so the banks hang on to them. But it just tells us that we still are gonna follow our same rules for currency as any other measured number. We had four sig figs here, we're gonna keep four sig figs here. Just because we don't have a hundredth of a penny coin doesn't mean that we're going to get rid of it. So the last step here is now that we're in dollars per liters, we just be, if we want to get to euros per liter, we just have to do, find a conversion for dollars to euros. So based on last year's numbers, we can say $1.09 dollars is one euro. And that'll give us our final answer in euros per liter. All right, so speeds, densities, prices, all sorts of combined units wind up being useful to us in everyday life. And we can convert them just like we would anything else. If we happen to have one of our units on the bottom of the fraction, we just need to change how we're going to cancel things out. And just to get a final answer for closure, get 
Although, is this an exact number? So really, we're probably going to, because of the, the exchange rate being a measured number, this is our fewest number of sig figs. The only measured number that we're using as a conversion that's going to affect our final number. So we're going to wind up with 0.790. Euros per liter. Most, most of the exact conversions that you will ever use really are going to be on the conversion sheet. If you're going into engineering, you might have exact units that aren't on the conversion sheet for things that we don't actually, we're not actually using right now. Um, but most of the conversions that you are going to wind up looking up, if it's a speed, an exchange rate, a density, those are all measured numbers, which means they're going to factor into your final number of sig figs. Right? Only exact units, only exact definitions are going to be the one um, are going to have infinite sig figs. Good question, Katie. Um, because up here, we were going from, let me clear the bottom off here. If we wanted to go from cubic inches into the metric system, our conversion to go from cubic inches or from inches to centimeters only has inches to the one. And we need inches to the third power. But that's OK, because we basically just need to cancel out all three powers of inches here. And so we just cube this entire conversion factor. Right? And so what that does when we distribute that cubed is we get one inch, 2.54, and centimeters. And all of those are cubed. We get one cubed, inches cubed, 2.54 cubed, centimeters cubed. And right, so we just have to, when you're dealing with areas or volumes, you just have to pay attention to that. And if you're going to use a conversion that doesn't have, cubes in there, make sure that you're going to cube the conversion itself. All right. Let's talk about one more conversion trick. It's less a trick than it's a, a good way to make conversions work for you and not have to remember a bunch of algebraic equations. Um, anytime we have these combined units like density or speed or price, we can use those as conversions as well that allow us to go from things like time to distance. Normally, like converting from distance to another distance is pretty straightforward. Converting from seconds to hours is pretty straightforward. But if we want to go from five hours into how many miles did I go, we need, we need the speed, and the speed is going to be what allows us to convert between those different types of units. Right, so, and the way we can write that, there's, there's a lot of ways you can write it. You can write, okay, speed equals distance over time, and you can do algebra to solve for distance if you have the time and the speed. Um, and you can do the same thing with density. Personally, maybe this is just because my chemistry teacher in high school really emphasized conversions, it makes more sense to me to set it up as a conversion. Because that's really what a speed is, right? A speed is saying, if I say 65 miles per hour, that means for every one hour equals 65 miles traveled. So anytime you can, you have a fraction where you can say the top is equal to the bottom, that's a conversion. So 
if we wanted to do something like calculate how many feet can you travel in 45 minutes with a given speed, there's a lot of information in there. But it were, the key step is realizing that 65 miles per hour is going to allow us to convert between time units and distance units. So the way we would we could write this in and I'll go back to the the whiteboard here. If we want to go from minutes to hours and then from hours to miles and miles to feet. Well, minutes to hours is easy. We have 45 minutes. And every 60 minutes is one hour. Then we can use the speed. We want hours to cancel out. We want time units to go away and to be left in distance units. So we say, well, for every one hour, I travel 65 miles. And then last step is going miles to feet, which again, we know how to do. So minutes to hours, then we use the speed to go hours to miles, and then we can go miles to feet. Also is a very good example of why we need to be careful about MIN for minutes and MI for miles, right? We're dealing with both of them in the same calculation here. It'd be really easy to mix up your miles and minutes. So 45 over 60 times 65 times 5,280. 2.6 times 10 to the fifth feet. Hey, you guys, you, you see what I mean when I said that the easy calculations lay the groundwork for calculations that you might have been able to play around with 45 minutes and speed of 65 miles and get to the number of feet that you traveled. But being able to show it very clearly with these conversion factors makes it really straightforward to figure out how to plug it into your calculator, right? At least a lot easier than it would be if you were trying to figure this out um, without knowing how to do the dimensional analysis like this. Right, and we can do this with any combined unit. Any, any combined unit that you know is true for a certain situation, you can use, you can do it with densities. If you have density and you want to figure out, um, in fact, this is what we do in, in the lab for this week. If you haven't had lab yet, you have, might not have seen this yet, but that's how we got to volume of water that was being displaced for one of the parts. We said, okay, well, the density of water is 0 0.9970 grams per milliliter. Grams per milliliter is going to allow us to convert from volume to mass or the other way around. That's not right at all. So not 79.1. That's left over from the last one. Two point six 
times 10 to the 5 B. The other thing to pay attention to with these combined units is that they're almost always made up of measured numbers. 65 miles per hour is a measured number, right? Just like a price is a measured number. And, or a can exchange rate or any of these other combined units, they're almost always going to be measured numbers. Which means if you have a really good number, what if we got out the stopwatch and we knew what the time was down to the millisecond, but we only knew our speed was plus or minus one mile per hour, that means we still are only going to be able to keep two sig figs at the end. All right, so all of the numbers that go into your calculation wind up making a difference. So let's practice with this. We have density defined as mass divided by volume. Again, you can do algebra. If you're comfortable with algebra and you want to just use the density and the volume given to calculate mass, that's fine. For me, as long as we're in the process of getting really good with conversions anyway, it makes sense to use density as a conversion. And then that'll always make sure you know whether you're supposed to multiply or divide. So if we have a sample of metal, it's measured as having the mass of 300 grams and volume of, in milliliters, what's the density in grams per cubic centimeter? And then what is density in kilograms per meter cubed? Give you guys a few minutes to work on that while I figure out what the large crashing noise was in the other room. All right, no significant damage. Oddly enough, it was the dog this time causing problems as opposed to the children. All right, so if we want to find the density and we have grams and milliliters, finding the density is pretty easy. We make the units look the way we want them to. Take your mass, which we can recognize if, if it's not if we're not told this is the mass, we can still recognize it because of the units on it. And we have a volume in milliliters, but we talked about how milliliters are the same as cubic centimeters, right? So if we want our density in grams per cubic centimeter, we take our grams and we take our cubic centimeters and we just do the, the division. Right, so that would give us density of three hundred 
302.45 grams over 12.57 centimeters. which is gonna give us a fairly large density. It's pretty dense metal, whatever this is. Twenty-four point oh six. We have three or five sig figs on the mass, four sig figs on the volume. We'll keep four sig figs, and that's gonna be grams per grams per cubic centimeter. If we wanted to take that and convert it into kilograms per meter cubed, which are is the common physics units for density, physicists are dealing with larger amounts than chemists a lot of the time. So they like to report their density. Um, so milliliters is the same as cubic centimeters. So it is the same. Um, liters is equal to a thousand cubic centimeters. So milliliters to centimeters cubed, that's the one that's one to one. If we want to take that and convert it into kilograms per meter cubed, we can either do the conversion before we find our density, or now that we have our density is 24.06 per one cubic centimeter. Well, grams we can convert to kilograms, cubic centimeters we can, or cubic centimeters we can convert to cubic meters. So all we have to do is convert each of these. And again, you can do it separately or do it in the same row. If you're going to do it in the same conversion, um, a trick that I was always taught to make sure that you don't forget to do the units on the bottom, is to do the units on bottom first get it into per cubic meter first, and then you can do your conversion from grams to kilograms. So one cubic centimeter, and we wanna to go to meters. Well, we don't have a conversion for cubic centimeters to cubic meters, but we have centimeters to meters, right? So we can say for every 100 centimeters is one meter, and we're just gonna do that three times. Then we're going to can that'll cancel out cubic centimeters and we'll be left in cubic meters. The other piece here, we want grams to go to kilograms. So we have to say, okay, well, a thousand grams is one kilogram. We don't have to do any squaring or cubing of that one. So we're going to multiply by 100 cubed, which is the same thing as 10 to the 6. We're going to multiply by a million and then divide by 1,000. So our final answer is going to be 2.406 times 10 to the 4 kilograms per meter cubed. which seems like a really big number, right? But this is a pretty dense material. Water, for, for comparison, water is about one gram per cubic centimeter. We have 24 grams per cubic centimeter. This is more dense than gold. Gold has a density of about 19 grams per cubic centimeter. And we have an entire cubic meter of it, which is roughly, if you've ever done any, um, any yard work that involves buying a cubic yard of compost or something like that, it's about the back of a pickup truck. So we're talking about filling up the back of a pickup truck with a very dense metal 
So all of a sudden, 24,000 kilograms per cubic meter, that doesn't sound so bad when we put those units in perspective. Uh, all right, we'll end there for now. There's a couple more practice problems if you wanted to work on on more practice problems here, but there's also the homework. So I'd finish the homework first. Um, and then if you have lab with me today, then we'll, after today's lecture, some of the, um, some of the math in the lab should make a lot of, of sense, ties in pretty directly in dealing with densities. Um, and then we will, don't forget to take your quiz over the weekend. We'll go live tomorrow around noon or so. So you have to come back, think about chemistry over the weekend. Don't forget to do that. Um, but other than that, I'll either see you in lab in about 10 minutes or uh, I will see you on Monday and you have a good weekend. Sean, I had one question when you went over that number at the beginning when I was asking about um, converting, it was 450.01 milligrams to grams. You, you then mentioned something that was kilograms to milligrams where it was like 10 to the sixth or something. But if you have 450.01 milligrams and you convert that to grams, it's point four, five, zero, zero, one grams. Yes. So it's possible I was misreading the slides. I thought the slide asked to go from milligrams or from, from kilograms. There, there was, there was two problems. The, oh, the okay. You went to the second one, but I was asking about the first one, but if it was 0.45001 grams, how would you write that in scientific notation? Well, so it would still be 4.5001. You're just you're moving the decimal just one spot though. So you okay? So okay. I don't I don't know why I just got confused with writing that. I was like, do you even write times ten to the first? But that is okay. You absolutely can if you need to write it in scientific notation. When you're that close to the decimal point, you don't usually need to do it that way. Okay, but there, it you absolutely been fine. can. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Perfect. Thank you. I'll see you in ten minutes. All right. See you then.